Hello, and welcome to FinTech Impact. Today on the show, we have a repeat guest, Judd Mackerel, co-founder, Mile Marker, and Mammoth. Judd was previously on the show to talk about what he was doing with Mile Marker, and in particular about the challenges surrounding data and data management in our industry, which I tell you, every conference I've gone to for the last 15 years, same complaint. <laughs> the quality of the data, where it's located, how it's siloed. But Judd is working on something to help fix that for lots of RIAs. And with that, here's my interview with Judd. Judd, thanks for taking the time today. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Always good to see you. So, Judd Macro, before we get started, refresh our memory as to Mile Marker and Mammoth. Yeah. So, Mile Marker started both companies who started really early 21, and they're different for a reason. Uh, Mile Marker is focused primarily on the RIA and IBD markets, largely in the United States, but we'll expand that. And the issue that we're solving is connectivity and integration and operational scale for firms that are not able to specialize in those things because they are really busy solving their clients' needs, caring for them. Mammoth is similarly oriented. We started, we have a series of funds that we launched with some partners. And now we're orienting ourselves around the broader needs of alternative investments, private placements, and things like that, that really create this wrench in the operational scale of a lot of wealth management firms. And so we're going in there and streamlining that entire process in the same way we do that broadly for uh, technology at Mile Marker. Excellent. So we'll start with Mile Marker, go back to Mammoth. But basically, I'll, lay the, I'll do a little groundwork here. So when we look at the average RIA, depending on size, right, when you start off, you're taking out-of-the-box software that hopefully has integrations. And those integrations tend to be anywhere from superficial to robust, depending on how good the integration was done and how you know, tightly those two companies work together. But effectively, your data sits within a number of silos. And those silos, you're limited to what you can do based off of that. Now, you go to the other end of the spectrum where you have these mega RIAs, they will run their own data lakes, they will control their own data, they'll integrate into the data lake, and they'll be able to manipulate and do and build all kinds of crazy stuff that is very specific to their company off of that robustness. Now, the problem is, is this middle ground, this giant chasm of... We are, maybe I'm not a solo practitioner anymore, I've got a team, but I'm not, I don't have the scale to actually pay for the dedicated staff to run all this. And before I get to that enterprise, that, that large scale enterprise side, and pretty much that's where you're kind of coming in here. So talk to me about what the benefits of doing all this, like, first off, what are you going to do when you start consulting with these people? Then secondly, how is it that they can then leverage that to do things they couldn't do before? Well, I think first off, a lot of times, these problems have taken a backseat to corporate ambition. Mm -hmm. And that's not necessarily a problem. That's just the way things work. But a lot of times it compounds, it snowballs inside of these businesses where data is really getting, it's not getting better, it's getting worse every second that goes on because it's not necessarily properly structured. So what we do right out of the gate is we spend a, a few, a good amount of time based on who it is and what the situation is they're, they're trying to solve. And we really help them get a clear point of view or articulate, you might have the, the head of technology, you might have the head of sales or something like that. Uh, so often those things compete. <laughs> and we really try to bring them together and unify that to say, what is the most meaningful step forward with your data and your integrations and your technology uh, that we can take? And then we progressively roll that out into like a, an ordered rollout and phased approach to improvement. Because a lot of times you can go and like, there's a lot, a lot of things out there where you can sign up, you're going to hire a bunch of consultants and a year later, you might have something. I don't love that. I want to be able to provide immediate ROI to my clients in the form of clarity, next best action effectively for the organization. Um, so we really, really pride ourselves in, in making that happen and adding tangible value, even if it's writing the plan, designing how this should work, their own words probably repackaged and polished a little bit more cohesively that somebody else that comes into this project a year later can understand where to start based on the bigger, broader strategic vision. It's even prototyping. What do you want to do with this? How do we design the applications and experiences your clients or advisors or internal operations teams want? And then how do we start to address some of the operational deficiencies that might be just a lack of systems knowledge? So we augment that with technicians that really understand this stuff and may in some cases have built it at these technology companies that we can intersperse into that to immediately give that shot in the arm. So that's kind of how we do this. And then we roll into a very standard agile based method. Uh, so those companies, if they speak agile already, we can harmonize. If they mm -hmm. don't, and we kind of give them a taste of it. But sometimes 
They don't need a lot. They just need to understand what's next for them. And we run those programs behind the scenes. So hopefully that answers that question. It does to a degree. And I think it's interesting because you struck upon something there, uh, a couple of things. First off, it hasn't been a priority, right? A lot of times you start off small and you continue to grow and stuff sits all over the place. And then it's, is it necessarily cleansed or maintained the way it needs to be in order to be actionable, right? Because you change a human or you change a system and two columns don't line up the way they used to, or no one's making sure that it's valid or, or anything of the sort. So you basically do what you need to to survive and you keep on doing that for a long time. And sooner or later, you have this big problem behind you. And then the second thing that commonly happens that you mentioned there is that the technology people, especially early on, tend to be IT support more than anything else. Like, how do I make the systems run? I just want the email to always work. I want someone to handle the users and all that. That's a very different function than, than that of you know a technology, basically tech, well, CTO or for lack of a better term, I think a chief product officer. Someone who worries about how do you create the all-encompassing experience and use technology to drive the business forward, not as just something that is there to support the business. Yeah. So it's very, very common. So I mean, the fact that you can come in and play that consulting role, especially if firms who haven't had that experience, even firms who have that had that experience, the outside view is valuable. But the ones who I, I got to imagine that the ones who've never had that experience and are maturing to that stage must really be like, oh, wow, this, this is next level. Yeah, we, we certainly hope that. And we, we really don't want to compete with the internal people. The reality is that most people are drowning in all the different things that are going on every day. Now, they're running a triage center when, they, when it, that's not ever their intended purpose. I mean, so we're really trying to help elevate those people out of that so they're not dealing with all those things long term. But sometimes you have to wade through it to get to that destination. And so, yeah, it's, it's been a fun, uh, fun journey. And we're, we're excited about what our clients are able to get now yeah. with all their data and with their ambition uh, to be able to really you know, bottle that up and, and make it actually come to fruition. So let's, I mean, and I'll point out two things. A, the fact you've seen it across so many firms, it means you've seen everything. I mean, it's one of those things. You're an expert when you've seen how many ways it can break, right? Like, I think you've seen that probably many times in many different systems and how things get done. So that's one great skill set that they would normally have uh, the, you know, the line of sight on. But let's talk about the, the, the payoff. So you talked about wanting to see benefits early on and, and so that they can actually start to see that the payoff. You know, what is it that when you, when you get in there early, what are the kind of the earlier wins you help them achieve? And then what are some of the bigger ambitions that you've been able to put in place for, for some of these companies? Well, I think the helping companies really understand their data and actually find the authority inside of their data is, is very important. I and mean, often that's like our initial focus is how do we help somebody get that quick win and start to have those key performance indicators available to them, have a dashboard for them, have them get you know daily emails with updates on what those things are. So they actually could be making insightful decisions inside the C-suite. I mean, that's a, that's a quick win. Secondary wins are giving the ability to have a streamlined way to work with the home office. Most of the companies we work with are B2B2C businesses. So you have the home office, it could be in Toronto, it could be somewhere else. And they're getting requests from people in the field. And those requests might be subjective to that unique office or that unique role, or they could be the authoritative way to conduct business with the home office. We help put that together, integrate key pieces of data in there so that when the home office receives a request, it's actually intelligent. Um, it's really, you know, really has specific nature of, of what the deliverables are inside of that. And then it works with the core uh, task management or, or ticketing system that you already use. So it isn't something that's additional. It's additional, I suppose, but it's really to be a modernized augmentation on what you need to run a more scalable, dynamic business. Uh, and oftentimes, these are things that are thought of, but not really with a way to pragmatically embrace it. We bring that to it alongside the data that we're helping to shape and put together with uh, our, uh, we have a fractional chief data officer offering that we offer in addition to a fractional chief technology officer, not to replace those people per se, if you have them, but to really give them the right engineers at a fraction of the cost and a much faster time to procure so that you can actually start moving forward versus what, what you'd be doing on your own. Yeah, and the great, especially at certain levels of maturity, or the the fractional play is substantially a better option, uh, at least a more affordable option that they can basically get the the right kind of high level, really deep yeah. advice that can then be executed after that. So fantastic. So now, one of the things you mentioned earlier was the 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 fact that you launched this new service. Talk to me about what it is and basically where the net benefits are to consumers. Or sorry, net benefits. Yeah, yeah. So this this uh, came to us really as a number of our customers kind of started 
hinting at this, like, Hey, can you help us here? Cause the thing about it is like, we just gain a, a significant amount of understanding and expertise around these systems. And a lot of it's the things that we already possess between my co-founder and I, we've worked at a large share of the wealth tech companies in this space from risk alliance, less nitrogen to S and C to uh, black diamond to sky on the Salesforce side. For me, it was Orion. Uh, it was working with a lot of companies through my consultancy, working at Carson inside the RA channel. There's a lot of different things that we've seen. And there's a lot of people that we have in our network. I mean, uh, there's <laughs> some of us, I mean, we probably hired literally hundreds of people over the years in our varying capacities to do this work. And we know who's great. We know who to build a team around. We know who actually knows their stuff versus the people that like to sit in a VP level and pretend they know business and not do the work. Like we, we really want people that know how to do the work. They really care. And that we'll put in front of our clients to say, hey, this is what we do. So this charter offer that we announced, what it does is charter gives you a team augment with a subject matter expert that's really going to come in firsthand and look at your technology. Oftentimes, we're looking at your fee billing and your new account management. Uh, those are just key areas. And then you know, a lot of stuff around your capital market assumptions, like how you how you define those uh, and whatnot. We're going to look at that and apply uh, optimization. Uh, we're going to apply logic to it. We're going to put in workflows and business rules around that. We're going to use different technologies to help augment that. And then we're going to make sure your systems are truly implemented, implemented, but also integrated, that this these things actually can connect, are connecting, and they're connecting for your good. And then we'll go through a process of iteration to really get this more scalable. And a lot of times, this has come to us because many people we work with or are talking to say, Judd, do you know anybody that knows how to use Orion or knows how to make this happen with you know FSC, with Salesforce or whatever? And so we kept going through this process and we're like, well, I guess maybe we're, maybe we should do this. And so we went through a little bit of uh, evaluation and then decided, hey, let's launch this. And we launched this uh, here recently. And it's been amazing to see the value we can provide to these firms that they're not able to get because no one has time to study the vendors, to understand, to read the release notes even, and be able to practically apply it and to see that much of a data set historically to understand you know, how do I really truly implement this in this scenario? It just takes a lot of reps. And so we're able to bring these folks to the table to sit on their side of the table and get this done and move them forward and help them scale their business uh, very, you know, in a much different level. So it's, it's been a pleasure for me to see this happen because I've seen it happen in certain contexts, but seeing it happen, sitting on the same side of the table as our clients is a, is a real uh, wonderful thing to see. Yeah, I, I chuckled there when you mentioned the release notes because I, I struggle with that just with Salesforce alone, like two releases per year. And it's like, here's our 25 pages of release notes for everything we offer. And it's just like, and keep up. Yeah, so yeah. so then, but I, mean, I think it, it also, I mean, makes logical sense, right? You're going in and saying, hey, this is what you guys should be doing. And sooner or later, someone just turns around and says, do it for me, right? So, or can you find someone to do it for me? So yeah. why not you? And that makes perfect sense. And so not surprising that this is where it led you, but I'm sure that it's not what you started off to do. Now that said, how much of this becomes, I guess, turnkey for the next company that comes to you, right? I mean, like you're doing all these integrations, you're doing all this management of data. There's certain parts like the, the legacy data, like their legacy data has to basically be unique to them and transferred over. And there's always unique stuff. But I would have to think that as you're adding, I mean, as you're adding more and more integrations into this entire framework, it just becomes easier, right? Because now you don't have to retread on certain connections for e-money or whatever else it is you're working with. I, I would say, yes, there's some certain economies of scale that we do experience, but at the same time, we are inheriting a lot of their unique logic mm -hmm. um, and business rules that we want to, we want to honor them. We want to say, there's a reason you have that rule. Even if it's the firm you bought two years ago had that rule, well, we got to understand why it's there. Um, and then we got to work to where we can actually propose a proper change and, and start to streamline uh, how all this stuff works. Sometimes it's even like going from advanced to arrears billing. You know, how do we, how do we do that? Well, that ultimately affects our ADB. It affects our client agreement. There's so many things that kind of come out of that. But we have to understand, identify that path and then start working toward that progressively to make that actually happen. So yeah, it, it, yes and no on all of that. And, um, you know, we're, we're kind of there for the, the whole thing. And a lot of times the clients that are working with us often are doing acquisitions. So we sit in this place where, Hey, let's look, we're, we're excited about the acquisition wherein your operational team feels like they're drowning. 
uh, we can we can really come in and be a life preserver to say, okay, no, we're going to get this. We're going to make this scale. We're going to help you do the data management element of this uh, more modernly and more scalably. And then, you know, think about this uh, as, a, as a nice part of the business that is no longer problematic, at least to the degree that it was prior. Yeah, it's it's funny. I kind of like some I cringe when I thought about the when you mentioned the uh, the acquisition piece because now you're just multiplying the logic issue and all those unique idiosyncrasies idiosyncrasies of 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 data by every company, right? And that's right. you know it's one of these things where I've had you know the lay people who don't get that the unique nature of it all. I mean, when you answer the question about look, you know, well, there's some economies of scale, but not that much because everyone approaches it a different way. You know, the reality is is that. The there is no uniform approach to how data or or how things are structured. If there was, right, and it was just variables, then we would have an easier time with this. But no businesses, no business basically takes a template and copies it exactly, right? They gotta they gotta do the things that matter to them and what what it is they're trying to offer. So so yeah, not surprising there. So I mean, great, it's a great option for anyone kind of basically looking to make that leap. And you know, again, getting to build off of the the knowledge that you built, and not only that, now now an ongoing service that you built around this. So. Smart. No, thanks. Yeah. So let's move over to Mammoth and discuss mm-hmm. that there. I mean, I remember it was I think it was RA Edge last year when you mentioned you had started doing this VC stuff and working on platforms for it, which has led clearly to this to the alt space. So talk to me about um, basically what it is you're doing there in terms of building that platform. Yeah, I think if you if you talk to most people that are in wealth management that are running alternatives, it's not like a core competency. Mm-hmm. Um, and they were to rate. What's my experience on a scale of one star to five stars? Most people are like in a two star level, unless your family office and that becomes kind of your core competency. It's what you do. And so as we walk down this road, I was working with private investments a long time ago um, and working with closed in funds, open ended funds, like all these kind of unique things that people are doing that are becoming more popular, especially as the market went through a little bit of a, a little bit of a blip here. It seems like a blip, I guess, over the past year or so. But like, what we really saw was a huge opportunity to modernize all this stuff. When most business is being conducted still through PDFs being shared back and forth, and uh, most many of these funds are so small, they don't fit custody requirements. There's a lot of need there to, to simplify this because the other side that I saw sitting on the same t- side of the table with the advisor is that many of these deals are the deals your clients are going to do with or without you. They simply want to know that their advisor can help them invest in this particular type of thing because either they have a friend that's related to it, they care about it, they see the alpha generation opportunity, or they're simply curious. And when all of us are running mostly index funds in our portfolio, which are fine and all good, this is not investment advice, you want to diversify with something a little bit more unique, something as a narrative. Even the friends at the golf course or whatever you do for fun in the pickleball course. I don't know. It's, it's not course. It's a court. Is that so popular? You know, <laughs> pickleball talking about private investments. Um, but, you know, people want to have something to talk about that they uniquely participated in. Even if it's like a commercial real estate deal or residential real estate deal or oil and gas or mm-hmm. an ESG based thing. Like there's all kinds of things that people care about. But when they do this, inherits a lot of work for the advisor to, to manage it, or the advisor doesn't manage it at all. And it's something that's over here. And yep. if you're comprehensive in what you do, you should you should include it. Like, how do you include it? How do you advise on it? How do you think about the tax consequences of these deals? And, and because it's such a broken system, it really needs to be connected. The interconnectivity of all of this stuff is, is super important. And while it doesn't feel like a big deal the first time you do one of these deals, or the first time you actually make your own fund, at your RA, what you don't realize is you're creating a, you're literally creating a whole nother business, but you're from an attentive attentiveness standpoint, creating a much bigger distraction inside your firm. So seeing this and going through this ourselves, we realize that there's a really nice opportunity to come along and streamline how all that works from the seeing due diligence deals, having the right people to do that to the legal, finding the right legal guides to really guide you through that, that know that by the situation, how to advise you, to the technology and connectivity of that, to even the document management, sending us the, you know, the, the agreement, sending us the uh, paperwork and understanding what the position is and how do you structure this? How do we make this integrate into the core portfolio accounting system that that firm has subjectively? So there's a lot of need here. And so what we do, what we deliver is a single pane of glass, effectively, if the single way for them to go and manage all of that stuff that integrates with an increasing amount of the technology they already use. Um, it's kind of our 
our MO is like to, hey, it's all should be connected to help them keep their attention completely on their client and to integrate this fully into wealth management. Yep. And I mean, it's interesting because I told you when we were talking off air that I've seen a bunch of this, but I think one of the advantages you have here, one of the unique selling propositions is that it's what you're doing with, with, uh, with mile marker integrating, being able to layer this over top of it and solve their problem at the same time while you're solving all these other problems. It's, it's, that's the compelling piece of it all. It's, uh, it's you're coming to them with a solution because there, there's no, like I said, other plays out there, but no one real runaway winner that I've seen thus far. So you're giving them something that's highly flexible, that's able to handle these things. And I always laugh when, you know, you mentioned PDFs and all this other stuff. I, I'll never, never cease to amaze me that we spend all this time and effort on technology and experience and then all to populate a digital version of an eight and a half by 11 sheet so that someone can then put a digital version of a squiggly line on it. It's, yeah. uh, never ceases to amaze me yeah. that this is the world I still live in. Uh, yeah. So now last time you were on the show, you, uh, you made the prescient prediction that the SEC was likely to, at any point soon, basically make SOC 2 compliance a requirement for vendors in the technology space, in the fintech space. And sure enough, like, a week after the episode launched, that announcement happened. <laughs> so I'm going to put you on the spot. Any predictions for anything that's going to happen regula- regulation-wise or otherwise in the next, uh, next, let's call it 12 months? Well, while that became a thing for vendors, that's going to become a thing for RAs. Uh, your RAA is going to have to have a SOC 2 certification. Um, because especially, I mean, you are a technology company. You're, you are a media company. <laughs> you are a service company. You might not be amazing at any of those things, you're usually pretty good at the service side. That's how you've gotten your success. But the firms that are really transcending the next chapter are becoming a media company and a technology company. Well, the same way you have to have a really great compliance software for the media company aspect of, of what you do, your marketing, your brands, your podcasts, whatever, you're going to have to have professional grade software and processes to really support your technology and how you're doing things. So like using systems that help you go through a, a level of certification like that. And I, I would expect the SEC probably comes up with their own certification, but you know, ISO and SOC and these things might be appropriate. Um, but I do expect that will then come and be part of, especially as more and more the average size of firms is getting a little larger um, and the expectation of those firms is getting a little larger. I would expect that they will also have to go through a SOC certification. Yeah. It's or something that equivalent. I can agree with that. It's it's one of yep. those things. The when you actually think about the level of burden put on RIAs currently to basically steward their data, um, and, and frankly, you guys have more lax privacy laws than other parts in the world. So I think that is in turn like led to what I see as a as a really weird dichotomy. Like I find there's less concern over privacy and security digitally amongst RIAs than what I see in other countries, and it's because we've had these these things imposed upon us for years now. And so it would not surprise me if it was a privacy re- regulation or if it was a specific tech regulation that basically said, no, 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 you cannot just be using Google Drive to share client data with these links that basically aren't being stewarded or shepherded or sending, most, most often, sending all this confidential information by email all over the place, let right. alone let alone the, you know, the more heavy security stuff we're talking about, like SOC 2 compliance. I mean, like we still look at the base level interactions that most RAs go through, the amount of, of security or privacy violations or pri- potential privacy violations or intrusions is enormous. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. it would not surprise me in the least. So before we wrap up, you know, the three questions I ask everybody uh, to see what this end on a positive note, you've been through this before, so let's see if they match the previous ones. To go back and listen to the previous ones to, to make sure. Uh, so the first question is, if you had one wish for something to change in your company or the industry as a whole, what would it be? Man, I think, I think that for the industry as, as a whole, I think for people to understand the importance of investing now in their, their data and their analytics and their technology connecting and the ROI that that will have for them years from now, oftentimes it just gets set aside because there's some, always something more important. So I think obviously selfishly, Right. But, you know, I, I do think that it's it's a matter of it's, it's a huge advantage to the companies that actually take it serious, do the work, really get a clear point of view about what we're doing and, and put it to action. So you really can start storing your own data, managing your own integrations effectively and then start analyzing things that really matter. Make your make your company data driven and, and see what that tells you. 
Fidelity recently, I was at the 40 under 40 awards with investment news. I won during the pandemic here. I was kind of like this weird <laughs> parenthetical. Congrats. Class. Don't show up. And so, yeah. So I went, one of my buddies, Nick Engelbart from uh, Carson won and uh, my other buddy, Dave Allison both won. So I'm like, oh, I'll go up and do my class uh, thing. And um, one of the executives from Fidelity was speaking and they did this whole study where they analyzed a bunch of firms and they, they were finding a remarkable amount of firms are buying in the M&A game, are buying these firms that have so many clients that don't actually make that firm any money. So they're effectively spending all this money, multiples on revenue for revenue that's not actually there. And if firms are actually investing in their numbers, and I, yeah, there's clients that you just love. You, you're not, maybe not going to make money, but you sure shouldn't lose money on them. Yeah. <laughs> um, but like helping companies be data-driven and analytical to understand the value of their client experience and to the either downshift people into a lower tier program if it fits their budget or to upgrade them into a better service level experience. I mean, that's the future. Uh, that's where everybody's going to go. It's just a matter of time before everybody gets there. And, and it's, uh, I'll echo this and say it doesn't have to start with like SOC 2 compliance and managing your own data lake. Like it's, it's just, I think it's a mindset towards digitization of your business altogether and being able to, yeah, be able to ask those questions and do that math, right? I mean, too often, like you had a perfect example there and I've seen it before where, you know, I had, I've, I've turned down more deals than I can count and they'll come to me and they can't, A, they can't provide the data. So it's like, I'm sorry, like, you know, what do you want me to buy, right? And then it becomes, okay, I finally get it. And then I do the math. And as you say, it's like, well, I'd lose money on a third of this. So please tell me why I would do this deal. Mm -hmm. So it, it, that, that happens quite frequently, but I mean, even even those base level calculations and the intelligence that you can garner from it is 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 enormous. But so yeah, it's um, I'm with you. I think it's I often come have people come to me saying they want to transform the business business digitally, and they're like, I want to do all this. I'm like, no, no, you're gonna do the one thing, <laughs> the one foundational thing. You're gonna nail that for six months, and you're gonna figure out the next thing, and you keep on doing that. And it's like anything else, we underestimate what we can do in a day, overestimate what we can do in a day, underestimate what we can do in a year, and over time we get there. What's been the biggest challenge in getting the company to where it is today, and for both of them or either one? I think it's the always walking through and there's there's always more to do to get it right and to understand, you know, like when you go down a path and you need to like pivot that and the timing of that and like how do you do that and when when it's like a matter of like just pressing ahead or pivoting. You know, I think that's a really difficult thing for any leader uh, to figure out, but having the right team that's really resilient with that is such a huge asset to you. And I, I definitely feel like we have that in and uh, both Mile Marker and Mammoth, just to be able to to really keep the focus always on what the client wants and and to let that govern what we do. Because I think there's a lot of like romanticizing the scalability of software or software as a service. Mm. And at the end of the day, the client doesn't care how it's delivered. They They care that they get results. And so for us, they always remember that. Like, hey, look, <laughs> the shortcut is for us just to do the work and to like serve them well. And then as we go over time, we'll scale that more. But we know that our clients are going to be served well because we know the right thing to do for them. And those are the things that they're, they're fun challenges, but they make you better. And you just have to continually have the right mindset about it, even when it kind of, you know, you feel like you hit a, hit a roadblock or two. Yeah. I mean, it's client focus. Many people talk about it. Few people actually do it uh, is unfortunately yep. the case, right? Because we're all too, we're all just busy trying to solve problems and so yeah, uh, I agree with you there. That is always a challenge. Just even staying on that mindset and saying, is this the right thing for the client? If, even if it solves this problem, is, is always a challenge for anyone. And the last question I have for you is what excites you about what it is you're working on and keeps you getting out of bed in the morning to fight the good fight? Man, I just like right now, we're in this amazing time where I get to see points get on the scoreboard every day, whether it's from our, it's from our engineering team, I think largely, and it's from our process that we orient, you know, have implemented and how we have, really got everybody in the right mindset to understand service, understand that ultimately without our clients and without who they uniquely are, we don't have a business. But that is something I find deep joy in. I, I really love serving people. I really love this industry. I love that there is like a real massive tangible value in wealth management being done uniquely for unique people and unique situations with unique plans. And that is inherently unscalable. And that's totally okay. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to help people be completely focused on that element. Like, hey, that's okay. Because everything else in my business, we got. Technology is manageable, all this stuff. But like, it's only manageable because 
of the investments I've made here and the way that we uniquely deliver that advice. So that has me really excited. It's so fun to see more and more advisors come onto the technology we've built and use it and use it with joy and realize like, hey, this is this used to take me a long time. It doesn't anymore. I now have the insight I need. It feels like when I read about all the things happening in like AI and ML and whatever, I don't feel so dichotomous from that. I feel like I'm actually following trend, but doing it our own way and doing it in the best interest of our clients and our advisor clients. And so that that brings me a lot of joy. It gets me super excited. I have not had an alarm clock since I started this business. Uh, I wake up every day uh, with a fire in my belly to go and make this thing better for my clients and to love my team and serve them well. Uh, it's, I don't know, I couldn't ask for more. I've got an awesome family and a ton of support and we've had a lot of success and I'm excited about what's ahead. This is a really, there is a parallel there between, I think, you know, what you just said, how it's helping serve the advisors to serve clients and the better advisors, which is, you know, the be- to me, the, the, the ultimate, the best answer is when you, when you're happy seeing your clients succeed, right? Like that's, that's where a lot of us get fulfillment. Right. And I think that's, you're, yeah. you're saying that, but one level up and that makes perfect sense because it enables the next level down. But I'll also point out, you know, it's funny, you hit upon something I touched on a lot, which is the dichotomy of the technology may be scalable to help support us basically deal with clients. But the dealing with clients is never scalable, right? <laughs> it's just, just this interesting piece of, you know, I always say the engineers and and executives like to think that, oh, this means they're going to handle more clients. No, no, no. It means I'm going to handle as many clients more deeply because that's the way to do it. Excellent. Yeah. Judd, as always, it's a pleasure. And uh, thank you so much for taking the time. Glad to be here. Thank you. So that was Judd Mackerel, co-founder of Mile Marker and Mammoth. If uh, you were in the US and you're looking for help with your data and basically just leveraging all the cool stuff we talked about today, by all means, feel free to check them out. As always, if you enjoyed this podcast, please leave a review on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever your podcast. Until next time, take care. This podcast was brought to you by Woodgate Financial, an award-winning financial planning firm catering to high net worth individuals and their families. To learn more, go to woodgate.com. You can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Play, or find more episodes at jasonperera.ca.